Afraid of what? To feel the Spirit's glad release, to pass from pain to perfect peace, the strife and strain of life to cease. Afraid of that? Afraid of what? Afraid to see the Savior's face, to hear his welcome, and to trace the glory gleams from wounds of grace. Afraid of that? Afraid of what? A flash, a crash, a pierced heart, darkness, light, O oh, heaven's art, a wound of his counterpart. Afraid of that? Afraid of what? To do by death what life could not, baptize with blood a stony plot, till souls shall blossom from that spot. Afraid of that? Afraid of what? It's a poem from John Stamm, who was a missionary with China Inland Missions, and him and his wife were beheaded by communist rebels during the Chinese Revolution in December 8th, 1934. Both of them died. Afraid of what? He writes this poem. I just think it's beautiful that that, that man who would eventually die by the hands of, of other men would write, what's there to be afraid of? What's there to fear? To pass from pain to, to perfect peace? Afraid, afraid of what? And I love the end there. To do by death what life could not, baptize with blood a stony plot, till souls shall blossom from that spot. What's there to be afraid of? If, if God is for us, who could be against us? We all, we, we, we know those things. Intellectually, we understand those things. But until we are actually experiencing the deliverance of God, it is really hard for us to actually be able to sing, to write, to believe. If you have a Bible, flip over to Psalm 59. This is a psalm that, that correlates to the passage we, we read last week. Psalm 59, the, 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 the author of this, it's ascribed to David. We read this. Deliver me from my enemies, O oh my God. Protect me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from those who work evil. And save me from bloodthirsty men. For behold, they lie in wait for my life. Fierce men stir up strife against me. For no transgression of, or sin of mine, O Lord, nor for fault of mine, they run and make ready. Awake, come to meet me and see. You, Lord God of hosts, our God of Israel, rouse yourself to punish all the nations. Spare none of those who treacherously plot evil. Each evening they come back howling like dogs and prowling about the city. There they are, bellowing with their mouths, with swords in their lips, for who, they think, will hear us. But you, O Lord, laugh at them. You hold all the nations in derision. O my strength, I will watch for you, for you, O God, are my fortress. My God in his steadfast love will meet me. God will let me look in triumph on my enemies. Kill them not, lest my people forget. Make them totter by your power and bring them down, O Lord, our shield. For the sins of their mouth, the words of their lips, let them be trapped in their pride. For the cursing and lies that they utter, consume them in wrath. Consume them till they are no more. For they may know God rules over Jacob to the ends of the earth. Each evening they come back, howling like dogs and prowling about the city. They wander f about for food and growl if they do not get their fill. But I will sing of your strength. I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning. 
For you have been to me a fortress and a refuge in the day of my distress. O oh, my strength, I will sing praises to you. For you, O oh God, are my fortress. The God who shows me steadfast love. Christian, as, as you live fully for the glory of God, as, as you seek to live for Him and, and honor Him with, with the very being, with the very life that He has graciously given you, you will find that there are packs of dogs seeking to devour you. They seek to follow after the orders of their king, who is the, the prince of this world, the prince of the air, the, the prince of the present age. They come in many forms, seeking to devour, seeking to attack, possibly in the form of family members. Maybe they look like your boss or co-worker. Perhaps they're the stranger you don't even know, but, but, they, but they press against you because in their heart they are set against the things of God, and because you are after those very things, they are set against you. Psalm 59 is... Ascribed to David, it's a song composed by one who is acquainted with much trials and, and tribulation. Often, psalms have some wording, you know, by depending on how your Bible's set up next to the giant chapter number or, or maybe just below it, seeking to, to set the psalm in, in, in its context. So we have here, it says, to the choir master, according to do not destroy. We don't know what that means. We don't know if it, if it just means that there should be some seriousness to that. It's a mictum of David. Mictum is another word. We're not exactly sure what we mean. We, we know it alludes to something musical. Maybe it's a, it's a part of the liturgy that they would have sung or, or done. But we see here, it's when Saul sent men to watch his house, David's house, in order to kill him. Which is what we read from Psalm, excuse me, 1 Samuel 19. King Saul, in his jealousy, in his anger, in his rage, he, he sends men, who, who David describes as, as dogs, surrounding his house, seeking to, to watch out for him, to lay in wait so that he could pounce upon David and kill him, but David escapes. So what's the king do? He sends out another pack of dogs to meet David in Ramah, hoping to devour him there. Once again, God protects and he delivers David, his chosen one. So the alpha dog goes. And God protects and delivers him again. Beloved, the, the wicked howl. They, I love the description of, about these dogs in this psalm is that, that from their lips is a sword. Their, their words are cutting. They're, they're aggressive. They're, they're attacking. They howl because they will never be satisfied. But those who trust in the Lord, those, those faithful ones who, who rely on the sovereign God, the, the faithful ones sing. This, this is a song, and it's a prayer. It's, it's, it's a prayer song. I, I don't know how I would define it. But, but it reveals that David understood that, that regardless of whether these dogs are, are prowling right outside the door of my house or are chasing after me wherever I go, regardless of the circumstance, there is always, always, always hope, and there is always a deliverer to be found in God. You, like David, may have many enemies who are, who are attacking, who are seeking to, to do harm to you, but I pray that you would remember. I pray that you would remember, like David, that, that though you have my enemies, you also have my God. Look at what David says here in verse 1. Deliver me from my enemies. Oh, my God. I just, I just love it. My enemies, but I have my God. And you 
read a psalm like this, you have to ask yourself, what right do we have to pray this psalm? What right do we have to, to call out to God and to say, deliver me from my enemies, my God, not, not God. There's, there's, a, there's a personal relationship here. My God, deliver me. Protect me from those who rise up against, against me. Deliver me from those who work evil. Save me from bloodthirsty enemies. Do this, do this, my God. What right do we have to say that? If you're in Christ, you have every right. Because if you are united with Christ, if you are one with Him, He is our deliverance. He is the eternal hope. He is the answer to this prayer. In all circumstances, those who are united with Christ are partakers in all of the promises that Christ has. Even amidst difficult times when you are attacked and pursued, even in times when it seems like, like God has departed or, or, or even seems to be alluded here in verse 4 where, where, where David writes, Awake, stir, arise, come to meet me. Even in the times when it seems like God is gone, He's not. Because he has promised to be with us. The Psalter pens in Psalm 121. Behold, he who keeps Israel neither sleeps nor slumbers. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is the shade on your right hand. Shade being protection. I don't know if you've experienced this over the last couple days when it's ridiculously hot. There is some sort of rest coming into the shade. And I will say this. You don't actually experience that fully when you live in this state because There's humidity, and you can't run from that. But but a couple weeks ago when my family was in the the, the altitude and the the dryness of Salt Lake City, you step into the shade, and it is many degrees cooler because the sun is no longer cooking you, and humidity doesn't exist, just like in heaven. The sovereign God has promised to protect and to defend and to deliver his people. This deliverance might not always come in in the means and in the ways that we would hope. I think often when we call out, we say, deliver us from our enemies. We think he's just going to snuff them out. Ah, thank you, Lord. Often deliverance comes in different ways. I would encourage you to, to listen to last week's sermon to get a fuller understanding of how God often providentially delivers people. But deliverance might come just because God has already gifted you with an ability that protects you from the spear thrown at your head. Or the spouse who loves you and has a plan. Sometimes deliverance comes because God just gives you contentment in the situation that you wanted to be delivered from. Or maybe you are like the missionary who I quoted earlier. Deliverance came because God took him from this world. There's a lot in this psalm that we could take time to to bore down into. And, And I think of like English classes... And, and, and sentence diagramming where, where, where you, you read something and you, you take it apart and it becomes such a, a mechanical action that, that sometimes you lose, if you will, like the passion of it. There is something in this passage this week that, have I, uh, that, that as I have been kind of studying and reading that, that has stirred me, and I, I don't want to diminish that by, by, by getting into this, in a, uh, if you will, an academic way. I titled the sermon, But I Will Sing, because I desire us as, as God's people to, to see that there is this glorious, strange, but yet beautiful connection between suffering and singing. pray that we would see that so that our hearts would sing. I've heard it said, you can't sing the blues 
until you've lived the blues. I don't know if you've listened to blues. They're usually not the most cheerful music to listen to. But there's something that stirs in you because you can, you can connect with that, that pain. But as Christians, we would hope that there would be that last verse that you would see often in the Psalms where there's hope. I believe it was Charles Spurgeon who said this, Affliction is the tuner of the harps of sanctified songsters. Let me say that again. Affliction, pain, suffering, discomfort is the tuner of the harps of sanctified songsters. Those who have been afflicted are the ones who who pen the lyrics of of the psalms that that move us or the songs or the hymns that that express the depths of our hearts. If you you think of a song that, that, that you just connect with, there's something there that resonates with your being. And, and I think often most of those is because it's a pain that you have experienced that the songwriter is able to put into lyrics. We can know intellectually. I can understand God is omnipotent. He's, he's all-powerful. I, I, I can understand that, 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 that He's a protector. I know the passages that talk about Him being a protector, that talks about Him being a fortress, that talks about Him being you know, the, the rock that we stand on, that, that's, that's not shaken. And, and, and we can convey the truths of the gospel. We can speak of its mercy and, and, and the steadfast, loving kindness of God. We can do those things. But, but until we're able to t- take that and kind of run it back to the root of, I have experienced those amidst trials and tribulations. I've experienced those amidst suffering and discomfort, nothing else will will help that to resonate in our hearts. Until we can say, oh, what a wonderful moment it was when I saw the deliverance of God. We won't truly sing of His praises. Without that connection, you know, tying it to this point, which is often uncomfortable. I, I, I know for myself and, and, and for many others, it, it, it wasn't until I experienced the weight and the depravity of my sin and, and, and kind of felt that for a while. That it, you know, it wasn't until I experienced that, until I saw and truly, I knew the words, I understood it. I grew up in a church until I actually called out and said, I need you to deliver me from this enemy. I sang the songs for many years until I experienced it. And when I experienced it, the songs no longer were just hollow words falling from my lips. My voice was restrained. But once I experienced the deliverance of the Lord, it changed. So we cry out like David in verse 1, deliver me. There, I, can't, I can't do it myself. There, there, there's no other means out there. Deliver me, oh my God. Protect me from those who, who rise up for me. Until you're at that spot where, where there, there's nothing, until you're at verse 1, you will never understand verse 8. But you, O oh Lord, laugh at them. And you hold them in derision. You, you, you need to be at verse 1 until you can actually comprehend verse 8. And when you, when you see that connection, it leads to verse 16. But I will sing. I will sing of your strength. I will sing aloud of the steadfast love in the morning. For you have been my fortress fortress and refuge in the day of distress until we can say lord deliver me verse 2 from those who work evil save me from bloodthirsty men you will never get verse 9 oh my strength i will watch for you for you are the fortress 
until you, you call out and you experience that, that grace of God when he, he meets you in those needs, you will never come to verse 17 and sing, Oh, my strength, I will sing praises to you, for you, oh God, are my fortress. I know you're a fortress, but now you're my fortress. The God who shows steadfast love. The Psalms are filled with songs that flow from suffering to singing. The Psalms are filled with songs that flow from pain to rejoicing. For the Christian, there is a connection between suffering which we, we know looking at some other passages is, is actually refining us. It's a, it's a fire burning away impurities. There, for the Christian, there's a connection between suffering and singing. And so in the hopes to not make this a college English class, I just point out a couple of things. There was a great fire in Chicago in 1871, which destroyed much of the city, caused one family in particular to lose nearly all that they had. A few years earlier, prior to the fire, they had buried their oldest child who was still young. Just two years after the fire, this family who were friends with D.L. Moody, who was doing an evangelistic outreach in England, decided let's go to England and support him. Something had come up and the, the husband would have to be delayed, so, so it, it, the, the wife and, and their four daughters went over to, to, to go there, and on November 21st, 1873, their ship struck another ship and within minutes sank to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. A few days later, from Wales, the wife wires back to the husband in Chicago two simple words, saved alone. Horatio Spafford would leave immediately to meet his wife in England. As his ship was crossing the Atlantic, the captain of the ship calls him up to the bridge and he says, we are approaching the spot we believe that other ship that your family was on sank. And as the boat was approaching where the final resting spot for his four daughters were at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, he would go back to his room and he would pen these words, when peace like a river flows, attendeth my way. When sorrow like sea billows rose, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and he has shed his own blood for my soul. That song is still sung today and resonates with us because Maybe our daughters have not drowned at the bottom of the Atlantic, but we have experienced suffering, and, and sometimes we just need to remind ourselves, it's well, it's well, it's well with my soul. William Cooper was a poet and a hymn writer. He suffered many trials, including uh, severe bouts with depression. On one occasion, he was struggling so bad with depression, he attempted suicide three times. Both times failing to finish his life. He was eventually placed in an asylum for a time. Once let out of the asylum, he would move and, and become friends with another hymn writer and pastor, his name John Newton. John Newton described William as suffering from severe bouts of melancholy, was the phrase they used then. But even in these bouts 
even in these suffering, even in these trials of, of sometimes even doubting his very faith for moments and then having to run back to the truth that, that there is a God, there, there is deliverance, he would pen some beautiful hymns that show the delivering power and the mysterious ways in which God serves his purposes and plans. He would write, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilt and stains. Lose all their guilt, he stains. Lose all their guilt, he stains. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilt, he stains. Joseph Scrinnen was a man acquainted with much grief. As a, as a small child, he desired to, to become, like his father, a, a, an officer in the Royal Marines, but poor health kept him from that. Pursuing other things, eventually he would fall in love with a woman who loved him greatly. You see, you could read some of the letters that they wrote back and forth to, to show that. But mere days, days, before their wedding, he watched helplessly as his fiance was crossing a bridge on horseback, fall from her horse, and drown in the river below. To displace himself from the sorrow, he crossed the Atlantic and took up residency in Canada. He would eventually meet another woman and love again, but grief struck again as well. This time, his fiance would succumb to illness before their wedding date. A little bit after that, he would receive a letter from his mother, still in England, informing him that, that she is sick and, and probably doesn't have much longer to live and, and not having funds to return back to, to give his you know, last respect to his mother. He would pen a poem that he said God and him wrote together. That poem would be set to music and would eventually be known as What a Friend We Have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who with all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee, take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou will find solace there. Some of the most beautiful songs that still resonate with our hearts from, from many, many years ago are rooted in pain and suffering, but, but people understood, though there's pain, though there's trial, though there's discomfort, though there's hurt, there's a God who delivers. And they could call out and say, see my enemies, oh my God, deliver me. You are my strength. Do we call God our strength? Not until he actually has been. Is he a fortress and, and a refuge? Do, do we know the joy of his steadfast love? You could read the word mercy there. Not until we have called out. Not until the darkness of life and the sorrows come that we sing and see the joy of God in the morning. Not cheap, shallow songs that pretend there's no pain. No, those who suffer and see the joy of God's deliverance sing songs that see clearly the enemy, but see clearly a God who is greater and above all of these things. 
David's song, Psalm 59 here, is a song to the Lord. It's one that only those who have truly experienced God's deliverance can actually sing. If you don't know God in this way, you can't fathom verse 16 and 17. I know that there are some people here today who you can read through these things, but but you don't you don't grasp that. Take a look here again. I, I know I've already read it, but but look at here again at verse sixteen and seventeen. But I will sing of your strength. I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning, for you have been my fortress refuge in the day of my distress oh my strength I will sing praise to you for you oh God are my fortress the God who showed me steadfast love it's God's strength that's glorified in this passage not man he is our fortress not, not our intellect God is our refuge. He's the one who protects us. In His strength and in His steadfast love, those things work together to bring salvation, to be our protector, to be our hope, to be our refuge, to be our hiding place. May the songs we sing with our lips and the song that we display with our very lives declare boldly, the, the, with, with beautiful color, with passion, the strength and the might of God and His love and His mercy. But we can't do that until we've experienced it ourselves. I grew up singing, and I grew up in a house where, where music was often playing. I'm not going to lie and, and try to sound like I'm super manly here. I don't watch it anymore, really, but, but when American Idol first came on, you know, my family, we sat there, you know, and we were like, oh, Simon's right, you're terrible. And a lot of it was, you sang it, you followed the notes, great. But you can't sing that song because you don't know anything about it. And the same is true of us. We could sing songs with our lips, we can read the words, and we can say, I get it, I comprehend it. But you don't get it, and you don't comprehend it until you've cried out, there are enemies, and they are attacking me, and I can't save myself. Brothers and sisters, when will you sing? Soul rattling praise emanates forth from ones who see that their hope in life, in this life and in the next, is found nowhere but in Yahweh. Find joy in amidst the suffering and i'm not talking about it in some st sadistic way but but understand that joy can can be found amidst suffering because you know that god is doing something there by by burning away the idolatry by by refining you and taking away the comforts that we seek in this life so that we might have him more and see his glory more and see his grace more so that we would sing Suffering might be physical, it might be verbal, but often the suffering comes because God in His grace opens your eyes to see, I am broken, I am sinful, I am evil, I want to do what's right, but I continue to do what's wrong, I need deliverance. There have been 
many times that my eyes have been open to things and all I can do is not sit down and, and pray these eloquent prayers, but I just start saying, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. And what ends up popping into my head is, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness, oh God, I need you. Church, may we live for Christ Jesus boldly in a broken world. That means we're going to suffer. But it also means your eyes are going to open and you're going to see the suffering of other people as well. And your heart is going to break for their suffering. And so your words aren't going to just be, deliver me. It's going to be, bring deliverance. They need it. There is an enemy attacking them. There are, are wolves at the gate who are seeking to devour them. They are salivating, ready to pounce and, and, and to gnaw to the bone. And I know that you laugh at them, Lord. I know that you hold them in derision. I know that you are a fortress in strength. So I will sing of your glorious grace. I will sing of your strength. I will sing of your mercy. I will sing. And even those Christians who seem to be devoured by the howling wolves, have actually been found that God is still a refuge because He has delivered them. He has brought them in to their rest and they are singing. Oh, how they're singing. Perhaps they're singing, Behold our God, seated on His throne. Come, let us adore Him. Behold our King. Nothing, nothing compares. Come, let us adore Him. Oh, how they sing. I ask you, when will you sing? Because a day is coming when all will sing. At least all the redeemed will. So I'm going to ask the, the worship team to come up as I say these last closing words. And the reason I wanted to, to switch, kind of flip-flop, kind of some things that we do here with the order of the service is because we have a privilege. This is a blessing that we can gather together as the saints, ones who have been redeemed, ones who have, have called out and said, I have an enemy. I, I, I need a deliverer. I need one who is stronger than me. I need one who can, who can be a refuge in these times of trials. We have the privilege to sing boldly, and with confidence, we can lift up our voices, not caring about how they sound. Not caring about what the person sitting next to us thinks about. Because we're not singing to them. We're not singing unto men. We are singing to the Lord. May we see our salvation and sing. May we see the deliverance of the Lord and sing. Some of you I know right now are experiencing suffering and, and, and tribulation and trials. And I say, may you sing because you have a king who is good and has promised to be your refuge even right now in the suffering and the tribulation. Let's pray, and then let's stand and sing. Lord God, humble us. Let us be humble enough to echo the words of David. from the depths of our heart, may we be humble enough to say, deliver me from my enemies, oh my God. 
Protect me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from those who, who work evil and save me from bloodthirsty men. Humble us to realize that that is a plea that is only echoed out from a heart that says there is only one God who saves and you are not it. Yahweh is God, not man. Help us to, to, to with hope and trust plead that so that we might see the strength of your right hand, so that we might experience the rest found in the walls of your fortress, so that we may stand and say, I will sing, but I will sing of your strength. I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning. For you, my God, have been a fortress and a refuge in the day of distress. You, O oh my strength, I will sing praises to you. For you, O oh God, are my fortress, the God who shows steadfast love. I pray that if we have experienced the deliverance of God, that we would stand and our lives would sing, oh, that we would sing to our God and our King.